you want to become more efficient at something you do, whether it's writing, physical exercise, tidying up, productivity at work, whatever. You make a conscious effort to improve a specific aspect of your activity. But overall, you notice the needle isn't actually moving as much as you hoped. Very frustrating. Why? Welcome to Frank's Day Explains. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Cambridge, and I'll introduce you to a beautiful equation that explains precisely why this happens. Once you understand it, you'll be able to focus your effort just on the specific part that actually delivers significant results. Do you want to know the secret? It's very clever, but it's actually much simpler than you might think. And even if a little algebra is involved, I bet you're smart enough to understand Amdahl's law, even if you are usually allergic to mathematics. In 1952, 30-year-old Jean Amdahl joined IBM, which was then the largest computer company in the world. He made significant contributions to mainframe computers, and he became one of the greatest computer designers of all time. His company, Amdahl Corporation, became a significant competitor to IBM. In 1967, he formulated the influential law, which was named after him, in the context of speeding up a computer through parallelism. How does that work? If a computer takes, for example, 10 hours to perform a task, you might think you can shorten that to two hours by splitting the task into five pieces and then running them in parallel on five separate computers. Unfortunately, it never works quite as well as that because there's usually some part of the task that cannot be parallelized. And Amdahl worked out precisely how much of a speed up you can get. His intuition, like many truly great ideas, is obvious once explained well, but the problem was not at all trivial and it had fooled many clever people before him. Let's have a look. Let's say the system takes time s to complete the task, with s equals to n plus p, where p is the time of the parallelizable part, and n is the time of the part that cannot be parallelized. So imagine here n is a quarter and p is three quarters of s. If I wanted the whole thing, uh, the system has to go 10 times faster. By how much would I need to speed up the part that I can speed up, p? By 10 times, by 20 times, 40 times, stop the video and try to figure it out for yourself. Don't continue until you have your own answer. It's not hard, but it's important you figure it out for yourself. Okay, welcome back. Let's check together. Say that S takes, for example, 100 hours, made of 25 hours for N and 75 hours for P. Let's say I speed up P by a factor of 10 times. Now it takes only seven and a half hours instead of 75. Great. But N still takes the 25 hours it took before. The total is n plus p equals 32.5 hours. I will actually never be able to get s down to one tenth, which would be 10 hours, even if I speed up p so much that it takes only one second, which would be an, an incredible speed up of 270,000 times, then n will still take its usual 25 hours. And so it's just impossible for s to take any less than these 25 hours for n. So at best, if I reduce p to almost nothing, then I'm still left with n, which is a quarter of s, and so the maximum possible overall speed up for s will be four times, even if I speed up p by 270,000 times. So in general, in general, the overall speed up is the ratio, let's call it big R, between the duration before the improvement and the duration after the improvement. I'm going to add a prime to indicate quantities after the improvement, so I would write this like this. And this overall speed up ratio big R depends on two things. First, the fraction of S that can be improved. Let's call this fraction F. In our example, this fraction is three quarters. And it follows that P is equal to F times S, and since P and N add up to S, then uh, n must be the rest, which is 1 minus f times s. The second thing that the overall speed up big R depends on is how much I'm improving p by, and that's the ratio, let's call it small r, between p before the improvement and p after the improvement. In our example, if p becomes 10 times shorter, then the ratio of improvement is 10 times. What's the duration of the whole task after the improvement as prime in terms of these small f and small r? Well, clearly, even after the improvement, the total s uh, must be the sum of the non-improvable part and the improvable part after the improvement. But the duration of the non-improvable part after the improvement must be the same as before the improvement, because by definition, it was not affected by the improvement. So n prime is equal to n, and so is equal to what we derived before. Whereas the duration of the improvable part 
after the improvement must be what it was before divided by the speed up ratio by definition of small r. So if I plug both of these in here, I get. Now, if we put this all together, the overall speed up ratio for the whole system, big R, is equal to uh, the S before the improvement divided by S after the improvement, which we just derived over here. And this gives us where this S is at the numerator and the denominator simplify, of course. And this leaves us with, which is Amdahl's law. Now, if we greatly improve the improvable part P, meaning if we make the small r very large, then this f over r over here will become very small until its contribution to this denominator becomes negligible. And as mathematicians would say, the limit of big R for r going to infinity is 1 over 1 minus f. Uh, and this quantity is always larger than this one because it has a smaller denominator. And this means that this limit here is an upper bound. No matter how much I speed up p by, I will never get a speed up greater than this asymptote, horizontal asymptote for r, for big R. If f is 3 quarters, like in our example, then the denominator is 1 minus 3 quarters is 1 quarter, and 1 divided by a quarter is 4. And so the maximum possible speed up I can get is 4 times, which is exactly what we discovered earlier. Right? We did the example uh, numerically. So Amdahl's law gives us a quantitative limit for how much of an improvement we can obtain based on how large the improvable part is uh, with respect to the whole of S. So if F, which is uh, the fraction P over S, is a small fraction, say that only 5%, if the green P part is only 5% of the whole, then it means the improvable part does not contribute very much to S. And then I can speed up P as much as I like, but I will always be left with a 95% red part that I can't speed up. And so I will never get to speed up greater than 1 over 95%, which is about uh, 1.05 times, which is nothing to write home about. Whereas if F were 95% instead of 5%, so if the, the green part were 95% of the whole, then wonderful, the remaining non improvable part, the red part, would be only 5%, which is 20 times smaller than 100%. And so I could have a speed up of up to 20 times if I managed to make the green part very small. But notice that even so, there's still going to be an asymptote. And I would never be able to speed up the whole system by any more than those 20 times. So that's Amdahl's law. Computer architects following Amdahl's law say, make the common case fast. If you want to speed up a computer processor by improving one of its operations or one of its subsystems, then you should improve the one that is used most frequently, the, most, the, the common case, because that is what will give you the most significant benefit. And the complementary observation to that is that if you make an improvement to some part of the system and then another improvement to the same part, and then again and again, the more you speed up that part and the less that part will contribute to the total time because it will keep shrinking. And therefore, successive improvements are less and less significant overall. Beyond a certain point, the increase in uh, this big R, big R over here, uh, becomes insignificant. And so there's no benefit in continuing to go to the trouble of improving small r, which presumably takes some effort. You can see this as a quantitative formulation of the commonly quoted law of diminishing returns. Now, Amdahl's law is a fantastic quantitative insight into how to improve a system in the most efficient way. And Amdahl, as I said, formulated it in the context of computer architecture. But once you understand the principle, you may fruitfully apply it to many other contexts. For example, what activity should you target to save some time in your busy day? Let's say you're awake for 16 hours per day and you feel that you're wasting much of that and you want to get some of it back. You might decide, for example, that um, you're going to become more efficient at brushing your teeth. Okay? With some effort, you could learn to brush your teeth four times as quickly as before. But actually, you only brush your teeth for four minutes a day, say. So it means that f, this fraction f here, is four minutes divided by 16 hours, which makes about 0.4%. So however much you speed up your um, brushing teeth operation by, the impact is going to be insignificant because at the four times speed up, you will regain three out of those four minutes. But that's still less than 0.3% of your whole day. Whereas if, for example, you commute to work for two hours a day, then f is 
2 hours the value of 16 hours that's 12.5 percent much bigger than 0.4 percent or if you spend four hours a day playing video games as some people do then f is 4 divided by 16 and that's 25 percent so clearly these activities with a much bigger f are the ones you should target if you want to make a difference so don't waste time with irrelevant stuff a heroic four times speed up in brushing your teeth which is hard to achieve because four times speed up is not, not an easy thing to do whatever the task is it will only earn you a pathetic 0.3 percent improvement overall in terms of big r whereas reducing your video game playing by just a factor of two times not four times will instead reclaim over 12 percent of your waking hours which is more than 40 times better than 0.3 percent improvement so Andal's law quantifies the improvement very precisely. The arithmetic is very easy once you understand the underlying principle. So unleash your creativity by applying Andal's law to improve the situations that matter to you. And let us know in the comments what you came up with. Thank you for watching and have a lot of fun with applying Andal's law to your life.